Uh, I'm really happy and honored to be able to um, moderate this panel. I think the, the conference has been really terrific so far, and these panels have been um, best when questions uh, are brought up to the, from the audience, and I'd like you to, to do that as soon as you can. Um, I, we have a wonderful panel here, really a, a disti very distinguished panel. I'm just going to give uh, the overview, and maybe as they discuss some of the questions they may be asked, they can talk about how their own research has affected um, uh, some of these questions about new, new treatments in the post-genomic age, which is the title of this session. So uh, I'm going to start on this side. Jos Josep Levet is uh, co-director of our liver cancer program here and also has been a world leader in HCC and the first author of the only approved therapy, um, or maybe not one of no, 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 more, than one. more than one approved therapy in HCC and, and really a, an international leader in this space. Ramon Perez Soler is chair of uh, oncology at Montefiore Medical Center and uh, also a, a world uh, leader in lung cancer development and novel therapeutics in that space. Beverly Mitchell is uh, the director of the Stanford Cancer Institute. Maybe she can tell us what's going on in Silicon Valley and how it's different from what's happening in New York. And she's uh, uh, renowned for her development of drugs in hemolignancies. malignancies. Susan Horowitz is a distinguished professor at Albert Einstein and, and really developed, uh, uh, helped us all understand how Paclitaxel works, uh, one of the most important chemotherapy agents of the modern era, and I think uh, her perspective on drug development and, and targeted therapy will be very interesting. And of course, you all heard Dr. Baselga, who's the physician in chief at Memorial, give his overview, and, and I think this is also a chance to ask him a follow up question about some of his talks. So, uh, with that introduction, I'm going to start with uh, just a few questions I have, and again, I encourage you to step up and ask questions along the way. Um, so I'm going to start with the question about chemotherapy, and I'm going to go to Dr. Horowitz. Uh, the first question is, will we be giving chemotherapy, or should we be giving chemotherapy in 10 years? And is chemotherapy targeted therapy? <laughs> yes, to the last answer. Uh, it is targeted therapy, and I think actually we have made too much of this distinction between what is targeted and what is non-targeted therapy. Um, I'll use Taxol as an example is very targeted. It has a very specific receptor on the beta tubulin, which is part of uh, microtubules. So yes, it's targeted. Now we're learning a lot more about microtubules and about drugs like Taxol, because we use a generic word, microtubule, but we have actually 13 isotypes of microtubules of different tubulin proteins. And what we're finding in the lab is that a drug like Taxol doesn't bind identically to all of these different tubular isotypes. So if we know the isotypes which are present in a tumor, which are different from the isotypes that are present, let's say, in the breast in general, we have some insight into whether these drug like Taxol could be useful uh, or if there is an isotype which the drug does not interact with. So yes, uh, these are targeted therapies. We just haven't been smart enough to understand them. Anyone else want to comment on whether we'll be giving chemo in 10 years? So I'd like to agree with Susan. I think in the field of hematologic malignancies, we've been damaging DNA for a long time. All of a sudden, PARP inhibitors are great DNA damaging agents. But really, it's about what we're doing with these drugs, much of which we have never understood. And unfortunately, people say, oh, it's an old drug. You know, methotrexate's been around a long time. But there are facets of uh, the use of these drugs that I think are just coming to the fore. Uh, so I think clearly uh, there's a role, but obviously the newer agents in conjunction, especially immunotherapies in conjunction with some of these especially DNA damaging agents are going to be a huge advance. So I don't see chemotherapy coming to the HCC field. HCC has been chemo resistant for years. Even nowadays, there, there have been uh, three uh, phase three trials testing, again, DOXO in combination with sorafenib compared to sorafenib alone in phase three with negative trials. Also, Folfox was negative. So I don't see at this point, and with the perspective of check, checkpoint inhibitors mostly, but also combinations with uh, TKIs, uh, I, I see that that is not happening in HCC. So I'm going to frame it in a different way, maybe for you, Roman. Uh, you're in a disease where chemotherapy was standard for many years, and now immunotherapy has become a new standard. Um, but we don't hear a lot about how 
the standards of care mix, let's say targeted therapies and immunotherapy? What, what do you, A, you know, is that the future? Um, or, or are we gonna continue to do these treatments sequentially? And, and then B, you know, uh, where does chemotherapy fit, let's say for lung cancer? So your question was whether we'll use chemotherapy, and I will say, uh, where chemotherapy is curative today, probably yes. So if I develop testicular cancer and I come to see you in 10 years, I hope you give me chemotherapy because that's what the most spectacular success of chemotherapy. In lung cancer, chemotherapy is curative in locally advanced disease with radiation in 30% of cases, uh, non-small cell and small cell. It's going to be very hard to come up with something that replaces that, I think. But I hope we, we can say that we'll get there. Mm -hmm. None of us likes chemotherapy. As I said years ago, it's a crazy statement, that's the way Taliban uh, treats cancer. It's, a, it's an aggressive way of, and obviously relatively less scientific, you know? Right. So the hope is that we will use less and less, but I think in those situations, adjuvant or locally advanced, we will continue for many diseases but obviously in hepatic cell, or absolutely not. The answer is easy there. Right, right. Yeah. It's gonna be disease specific. Um, Jose, um, you know, our fir whole first day and even the first talk today was on immunotherapy, and you showed a lot of interesting data about sequencing the tumors and, and targeting uh, in basket trials, you know, very small percentages of people with BRAF mutations or AKT mutations. So how, how do, at Memorial and, and other centers, are people gonna combine these approaches? Is it gonna be a one size fits all or are we gonna somehow be able to integrate kind of targeting the immune system and targeting these, uh, these genetic changes in, in, in rare tumors? So, so we don't know the way this will play out. I think that you can make some broad statements. Uh, for example, there are gonna be tumors clearly that they have uh, a, a very high number of genomic alterations. These tumors that are hypermutant, maybe because they have been treated uh, there's no way these tumors will respond to specific targeted therapies. And I think that's where clearly immunotherapy will play a huge role. So these hypermutant uh, melanomas, or uh, they're not going to respond for a long time to BRAF inhibitors. So I think there are clear uh, places where you can apply first immuno-oncology and others, such as histiocytosis or some leukemias, in which you will apply targeted therapies and immunotherapy is not gonna work. And then there's gonna be the whole area on, on in the middle in which we will need to explore rational ways to combine therapies. And I think uh, we need, so there's gonna be one risk there and the risk is that everybody is doing multiple combinations. And that's a trip to nowhere. Um, I was counting the other day the number of clinical trials that are going on with PD-1 and, and PD-L1 blockade, we have over 800 clinical trials going on. So uh, for most part, that's gonna be non-informative and, and, and it will not result. But somehow we need to apply some rationality to this. So, and that is where we need the science to tell us uh, where to go. So, um, uh, so that's what we need to do. I think we'll just apply everything. I mean, uh, even chemotherapy. Chemotherapy, I, I actually agree with Susan, it's totally targeted in triple negative disease. This is a disease in which we are curing patients. So in the neoadjuvant setting, in triple negative, if a patient achieves a PCR, a pathological complete remission, that tumor will not come back. And the interplay between chemotherapy and the immune system uh, is gonna be very obvious. I mean, those tumors that have a strong lymphocytic infiltrate do better with chemotherapy. Uh, the data is very, very robust in that regard. So I think it's gonna be all incredibly confusing <laughs> before it gets clear. Yeah. And we will need to learn, as we have already been learning, to navigate uh, in a sea of uncertainty. So um, if, if, if there was a way, if you were the I'm not going to say President of the United States, oh, uh, oh. but if you were uh, able to create some way of having some rationality based on the state of the science now, let's say, you know, the, we have the most powerful people in the country here sitting on this panel, maybe you are, <laughs> to be able to kind of take a rational approach. You know, we all are in um, 
excellent cancer centers where we're trying to do our best and yet we have these many, many different combinations because it's what oncologists do. Is there, is there a rational way to approach this, let's say on a policy level or on a national level? Um, I'm gonna just throw it out there. That's not a question that I would normally think about, but I think you know, this is like that question, if you had you know, $10 billion, how would you cure cancer? Which I won't ask you, but you know, how, how, how should we, let's say even within our institutions, start to, to do what you're asking? So let me give one step, and then I'm sure Beverly and others will comment. But I think there are two ways to deal with this. One is uh, science is driven in great part by technology, right? The, the questions are always the same, but technology enables you to ask questions that otherwise you would not be able to answer. So I think what we need to do is somehow find funding, if I had the capacity to fund, for platforms that could be implemented across cancer centers uh, that could get critical information. So for example, genomics, the cell-free DNA, the whole effort at identifying the predictors of response to immune checkpoint blockade. That has to be done. And as many patients as possible would need to be screened so that you can get the clinical information. So I think that's point number one. And then point number two, the system we had in place until now, it's a very good system, is the system of uh, providing federal support for research so that good research is peer-reviewed and is being financed. I mean, you know, we are not short of ideas, we are short of money. <laughs> so I think the idea of the government uh, providing support for basic research is at the center of what we need to uh, try to achieve. Beverly? So I would add that the, the support for clinical research is, is not at the level where it needs to be to get some of these good ideas. I mean, a lot of our, I hate to say it, but a lot of our studies are pharma-supported studies. Um, they're, they're fine for getting drugs approved, but they're not the way we're going to get some of these good ideas forward. And the support for clinical research, I think, really uh, is suboptimal. And, and the other problem is the consensus building among people who have the funds to allocate. And again, I don't want to point fingers, but I think the ability to gain consensus among even cancer centers where we should have people who are dealing rationally with this um, is, is not as great as it could be. So I don't know how policy can affect that. This is partly human behavior. But uh, I would certainly advocate for more money for um, investigator-initiated research. And just to follow up for you, um, you're in Silicon Valley. Uh, you're surrounded by you know, these companies that um, believe they could change the platforms for a lot of different fields, communication, um, uh, technology. Uh, driving cars, whatever it is. So w what do they say? I mean, when you sit with them at Stanford, uh, do you have conversations about how to you know, use technology to, to change the way, let's say, research is funded or, or the way uh, industry can interact for these big kind of ideas? So I think the, the general feeling is that the more information you can collect, the better. So we have this Google baseline study that's going to have 10,000 people uh, looking prospectively at who develops cancer, developing uh, using wearable devices, using all kinds of biological assays. So that's where a lot of Silicon Valley Apple's trying to do the same thing. Um, it's not where we are at, in medicine, where we're trying to develop things from the patient up to some extent. Uh, so it's going to be interesting, but it's going to be decades before this yields information that will be useful, in my, in my opinion. Just, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, William, you mentioned the word politics to a, a lung cancer expert and tobacco is going to come in. And it's not therapy, but I think it's worth saying it, that the disease kills uh, or 30 percent of cancer deaths are due to tobacco and society is unable to really make that illegal. You get a fine if you don't fasten your seatbelt, but you don't get a fine if you smoke on the street. Mm -hmm. So I think for us it's very important to always say that, that a lot can be accomplished through political action in lung cancer and nobody's doing anything. At the campaign, the, the word tobacco is not mentioned even once mm -hmm. in this country. And I think it's a lot of deaths, you know? So it's not therapy, it's beyond, it's digressing, but I think it should be said that it's not only science who cures people, political action can cure people too. Well, I think there was a statistic from the ACS and Otis is here, Otis Brawley, but the biggest uh, decrease in uh, lung cancer deaths was really from just a, a decrease in cigarette smoking. Absolutely. All of our therapies combined probably have a much smaller impact than just some public health uh, initiative like that. 
Yes, I, I just want to mention that also I think regulatory agencies have a role here in order to provide the, the, f the ideal frame for approval of biomarker-driven trials or even pre-plan analysis for identifying responders. So for instance, now we have approval for nivolumab in second line HCC based on a phase two trial of 260 patients, 20% objective response, nice overall survival. PD-1 immunostain does not predict outcome. So there is no effort there coming from the regulatory agencies to say to the company, okay, now you are in charge to identify the biomarkers that predict response. And then you have to devote a trial to that and you have to allocate money to that. Also, you were mentioning that I was the PI of the sorafenib trial. After that, and very recently, we have four new drugs. So we have uh, rigorafenib, we have uh, lenvatinib, lenvatinib in front line, rigorafenib in second line, cabozantinib last week in second line, and nivolumab. For none of these five drugs, we have any biomarker to select responders. So I think that if the regulatory agencies were more, uh, let's say, uh, sensitive to this effort. I'm, I'm positive that all these drugs are not favoring all the patients, but a subgroup of patients, we will improve the precision medicine. Well, I think that in thinking about uh, drug development, um, I worry that we do not have the um, chemists being trained today that we need for this area. We need to have um, x-ray crystallography of these sites so that we can determine and define drugs and modify drugs and know how they will affect their site. And uh, this brings up the whole idea that we need to train young people to, in chemistry and physics to understand this and appreciate the value of going into this, these areas. I think that's very important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in thinking about um, uh, the issue of biomarker-driven studies or basket trials, which, um, which Jose showed really nicely in his, in his talk. We still think anatomically, I introduced many of you, even Jose as a breast cancer oncologist, <laughs> lung cancer oncologist, uh, hematologic malignancies. So, you know, our, our vision is for something, you know, that is trans-anatomic, and yet our day-to-day -day remains, uh, um, you know, within the disease. I'm a GU oncologist. I'm trying really hard not to talk about prostate cancer because I'm a moderator. Um, how, how do we get past that? Are we ever going to get past it? Um, Jose? So I think anatomy matters as well. An anatomy matters. Uh, so if you look at the particular genomic alteration, it has different meaning in, in different tumor types. And I think the macro environment plays a huge role. So just to give you an example on the BRAF study, we did not see any response in colon cancer, not one, and in patients that had BRAF mutations. And at that time, um, um, uh, Jeff Engelman and, and, and the group in Amsterdam uh, published that in colon cancer, EGFR receptor uh, can bypass the activation uh, of, uh, of BRAF if you block it. So I think uh, these statements that we're gonna have genome-specific clinics I think, uh, I think that's an overstatement. Uh, we cannot simplify reality. Reality is gonna be complex. So the neighborhood still matters. The neighborhood still matters. Uh, what about BRCA as a model for um, a, you know, either germline or somatic um, alteration that, that may be driven more by the gene than by the, the, the anatomy. So anatomy. if this is the case, why do BRCA mutant ovarian cancers respond better to PARP inhibitors than BRCA mutant breast cancers? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Neighborhood man. And prostate cancer, as you know, is now <laughs> suddenly know. a BRCA, uh, you know, yeah. mutated yeah. cancer that responds quite well yeah. to some of these drugs. Uh, by the way, carboplatin works great in BRCA mutated cancers. Yeah. To your point, Susan, that, that uh, even some you know, really old, and I think Beverly as well, that these old drugs actually have some of these same targeted effects. Um, so let me ask uh, something that we haven't heard about. And please, if anyone has questions, please come up to the microphone, because I'm running out of questions. Uh, I have a comment. Let, oh, go ahead. Yeah, you no, I have a comment. Yes. I think an, another area that is, is critical, 
Uh, Josep showed a slide that I love it in, in cell 2017 with all the cancers there and the percentage of druggable mutations for each cancer and also with a bullet of uh, if are FDA approved. And in HCC we had 20% of potentially druggable and zero approved, right? So I think that a huge effort still is need to identify ideal drugs for some of the drivers. So for instance, in HCC, it's very clear, 25% of the tumors have uh, beta catenin mutations, and this is a critical driver, a critical pathway. Still, we don't have drugs for beta catenin. Mm. So uh, needless to say, with MIC that is always there, or P53, so I think that another effort in the next five, 10 years uh, should be to transform these potential targets as druggable. I think that this is an important step. Yes. Question is for uh, Jose. Thank you so much for bringing in the anatomical angle. Uh, I was very relieved to hear that <laughs> because uh, neighborhood does matter. And you know, when I think about basket trials, uh, you're looking at a specific mutation across various indication and anatomical and physiological subtypes. How do you accommodate that kind of heterogeneity of physiology and anatomy when you design these basket trials? What are the considerations you make? And is this the reason that we don't, we're not gonna see basket trials as first line, but it would remain third line mostly? Well, no, I think the first line or third line, that's a question that is different. It depends on, again, if you have like superb first line therapy or not. So I think that's a different, so I think the way you address this is by being very flexible in how you design the clinical trials. So for example, you have a first iteration of design to the best of your knowledge. So you say, best of my knowledge, I would like to uh, study BRAF, say in lung cancer, in colon, in ovarian, and then I'm gonna have a group that is a pupuri of, of tumors uh, just to see if you have a signal. And then, if you have a signal, then you can build on that. So that was our history with histiocytosis. Um, uh, I didn't know about the disease at all, and we had a neurology attending, incredibly smart, uh, Ellie Diamond, that was rounding on the floor, and he happened to have a patient with this disorder, and he's the one who looked at the literature and said, you know, 60% of these tumors have been rough, and then we began to enter patients, and when we saw that there was a signal, then we built an, an arm for that disorder. In colon cancer, we decided that we were going to treat a number of patients. We treated eight patients, not a single response. We closed the, the arm. Then René Bernard published the paper in Nature, and Jane Bengelman published the paper in Cancer Discovery uh, after two months of us having closed the, the, the arm. And we said, hold on, now we're going to reopen the arm, and we're going to open EGFR. So I think that basically what you do is that you design the trial in such a way that you are open to introduce the modifications that are required. And to me, this is particularly appealing because I always say to my fellows, this is the renaissance of the clinical investigator uh, because a good clinical investigator um, has the power to visualize something that you can build from that, right? So I think it's, uh, it's, it's good, it's very good. And you need, again, to develop and promote and acknowledge the clinical skills of the people that are doing these trials. Thank you, Janice. Thank you. <clears throat> I'd like to ask a question in a slightly different direction. We heard this morning and again now the wealth of information and data that's being generated. Uh, sometimes, uh, Jose, you showed in a very elegant uh, report that's generated for clinicians and stakeholders, patients, their families to uh, understand. I'm wondering in your own realms how you've addressed this taking advantage of technology to educate um, the participants, the clinical interface, and stakeholders at large to this rapidly evolving field, basket trials and molecular targeted therapies. Maybe I'll uh, ask uh, one of the other panelists to take that on, maybe, Beverly? So I think at, at the micro level, um, having a tumor board where this is discussed, not just for a decision, but with some attention to detail and education of the people around you, then the problem comes getting the fellows and the faculty to attend. But aside from that, I, th I think you need to have this um, uh, really a, a communal effort to, to educate. In terms of the patients, it's a lot more complicated. 
a lot of studies are being done in how to communicate this information effectively. I don't think one answer is not going to, uh, to hit all of our patients. Um, there are some uh, web-based systems where risk can, can be uh, communicated to patients, um, but I think a lot more effort needs to go into that with, with trained genomics um, specialists trying to communicate. Yes, question over there. Hi. Uh, oh, cool. So uh, one issue that's been brought up repeatedly is the impact of technology in cancer research and um, specifically DNA sequencing technologies. And as uh, Jose brought up, uh, that possibly the evolution of cancer is not stochastic. And so I was interested in, is the limitation on a sample size or is it a limitation on the technology that's being used to, to probe the samples themselves? Okay. So the technology is here. Uh, the issue now basically is, I think, at two levels. One is at the cost level, because ideally you would like to do selfie DNA to check real evolution in real time. So one is that, so the sequencing capacity is, is, is here. I mean, we can do it. And, and uh, actually some people in, mostly in Silicon Valley, uh, you have all these companies that they, they, they do it. I mean, you know, Google does it, Verilis does it, uh, Illumina does it, uh, Grail does it. So you have a number of institutions also that, have that can do it. So it's how you analyze the data. So I think the bottleneck, the bottleneck is cost and the bottleneck is data analysis because that requires uh, a huge bioinformatics platform. Right. If the if the bottleneck is cost, how would you incentivize companies like Agilent and Illumina, whose primary motive is monetary, to you know, help scientists push their research forward? Well, we need to prove value. And once you prove that this is something that is useful, it's all about reimbursement. I mean, uh, the, the cost of the sequencing is going down. It's going down tremendously. Uh, it's the reimbursement that needs to take into, uh, that needs to be put forward. Uh, my question is on a little bit of a different level. It's um, uh, how does, um, you know, there's always been a dialogue between uh, basic scientists uh, who work at the bench and don't see patients with clinician scientists uh, who are in the clinic and doing clinical trials and reporting the results. And obviously there are some physicians, scientists that straddle both worlds. Um, but if I'd like to get uh, some advice from the panel to uh, some basic scientists in the audience, we have a lot of basic scientists in the audience. I just wanted to know if, you know, given where the field is going, where are some interesting uh, areas uh, you would recommend pursuing? Well, maybe that's a good question for Susan. You know, you're, you're a PhD scientist, uh, you don't see patients, and yet you were involved in uh, the development of maybe one of the most important drugs of the modern era. So how, uh, how did you have that relationship with clinicians? Well, I didn't have it at the beginning because I've been in this business a long time. Um, I, I think there's been such an enormous change from when I started working uh, as there is today. And all of the science, I think all basic scientists today are looking for problems that they can work with clinicians. I mean, that's funding is in that area and we're all thinking in that, in that direction. So um, I'm actually going to be involved in a whole course next week in Boston in which we are going to be discussing these things with PhD students, and it's an AACR course on translational research and how do you become involved. And of course, at a place like Mount Sinai, you're in a fabulous position to interact with the clinicians, many of whom will clearly interact with you, especially if you approach them. Hang on to their coattails. See if you can go on rounds with them. Um, really see what are the clinical problems and how can I participate and how can I help. And I think um, that is really what we're all interested in today. And I, I can't encourage you more, those of you that are PhDs and may think that what you're doing has nothing to do with anything uh, medical um, to get on board and actually push in. There's nothing wrong with doing that. There's nothing wrong with being proactive. And I think if you're interested in interacting with physicians, 
uh, you can do it, but you have to push on. Excellent advice. Uh, Jose? So I have one comment. Uh, Ramon, since you're the chair of a cancer center and you have lots of money, uh, <laughs> one, one, one thing that uh, we have done that works very well uh, is we call it uh, the Functional Genomics Initiative. So that is, we have inside grants, not, not very large, uh, for PhD scientists that um, they have to address uh, to study the mechanisms on some genomics that are relevant to cancer. This could apply to genomics, could apply to, to immunology. So somehow you could foster that, you know, um, that the basic scientists are working uh, on, on questions that are clinically relevant. And, 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 and that uh, works well because instead of sometimes working on models of uh, C. elegans, which are important, and, and so on, they are. But, but these minds also can be incredibly useful at helping uh, um, genomic alterations that are present in, in patients. So we have this call, and every year we give three or four grants, not very large, but that's the way, because in these teams, you need to have a clinician to be able to address the question. Just Yes, <clears throat> I think it's a matter of, of communication. So I think that the ideal venue for that is to create a specific uh, cancer programs. With the cancer programs, you have basic scientists, translational, and clinician, and, and this is the venue to, to interact. And they are exposed, the clinicians are exposed to the basic science done in the same institutions and the other way around. Uh, also, in, in the line that Josep was saying, uh, for instance, in, in the SPORE call, uh, even basic science, I oblige to include an aim with a translational clinical component. And I think that this is very important. So I think that for basic science to, to work with clinicians is one step to communicate with them. Sometimes the world the, is, is a different world. There is not so much interaction. But if they think in their proposals uh, to include a clinical aim or a name with a clinical endpoint with a biomarker, and then this will uh, facilitate a lot the interaction with uh, the clinical folks. Yeah, and I think it really starts also at the top. We know the current NCI director uh, just won the Lasker Award for his uh, observations about uh, uh, HPV and, and cervical cancer, and it's had a huge impact. Um, and the current, the, the incoming NCI director is actually a cancer center director from UNC, Ned Sharpless, who is a practicing oncologist and a, and a, a laboratory-based uh, translational researcher. So I, I think it really, I, I think it really is a critical piece, and at, we're all very busy, and we have our, our own conferences to go to just, just to be able to communicate in our own field. So the ability for leadership to kind of create those forums as uh, Susan and, and Jose and Joseph have pointed out is, is really critical. Go ahead. Hello. Um, I'm an undergrad student, and I, and I shadowed a physician who was in practice for 67 years, and he was an oncologist. And when times were flexible back then, he would uh, visit the homes of patients and monitor chem chemotherapy and uh, consult with them, comfort them. How but, long ago was this? Uh, <laughs> I think, like, um, maybe when he was in his 50s, because okay. he was in his 80s. Because he seemed young. And, um, with the definition of novel thera uh, therapeutics, do you envision a future where um, treatments are mo very um, intimate uh, with the rising technology of like uh, Amazon Echo or like Google take over, taking over people's homes? <laughs> Roman, you wanna take that? Can you rephrase the question because I think it's mm -hmm. fascinating. It sounds like very innovative. What was the exact question? Do you envision um, with novel therapeutics to be very intimate with, with patients? Like, uh, being in their home with like the new rising technologies of Amazon Echo or Google? I, I envision internet connections. I envision less face-to-face -face visits. I envision more using, you know, teleconferences and video conferences. I envision sending questionnaires and monitor those and peace and figure out when they need to come, where they don't need to come. Of course, the, the thing of parking a parking lot and seeing a physician is an old-fashioned concept. A lot of things can happen at any time of the day, the doctor being somewhere around the world and the patient being in another place of the world. Yeah. Absolutely, I think this will happen because it will be very convenient for the patient and for the doctor. Yeah, one of my colleagues just did a study of metformin uh, using tele uh, teleconferencing, video conferencing. Uh, but that's, metformin is cheap, oral, and, uh, and uh, non-toxic. 
So maybe a question I want to ask before the next person is, um, what about toxicity? Do we as, uh, you know, a, a lot of this is about efficacy, and we know that we probably, patients don't always understand toxicity. Let's say with immunotherapy is a very good example. Yeah. So do we study kind of the predictors of toxicity enough? Uh, do we understand enough about, about who actually has side effects from the drugs that we're talking about? Beverly? I'm not sure we study it enough. I think with immunotherapy, this has come very much to the fore, and the question of communicating what is a known risk, but, but who will get it is something that's it's obviously much more difficult. Um, whether funding for that is going to result in, in improved uh, outcomes, uh, improved prognostic ability, I, I would be a little dubious about it. Yeah. There's so much individual variability, but I think it's a very important question. I mean, we should... Anyone think else have thoughts more. about toxicity? Yes, I, think, I think we will do it. We will do it for uh, those therapies that are life-threatening. Then, then we need to do it, and that's that's. So, for example, CAR T cells. Right. Yes. The first papers are beginning to appear now that are identifying very nicely which are the predictors of toxicity. Right. So there's a paper in Cancer Discovery coming out uh, that is already online and others and. I think the same had happened with bone marrow transplant, right? That we had to do it because you cannot afford people dying from. Yes. But on the other ones, it's so difficult. Yeah. And it's so, uh, you know, we don't understand the, you know, and, uh, the variabilities of each patient that is so complex that I, I'm not optimistic. And again, the funding for that and the analysis for that, it will be tough. Yeah. Okay. What will happen, yet one more sentence is, the patient reported outcomes will be very useful. So what we will have is that we'll have our patients at home with yes. the iPads, and they'll be keep clicking what's happening, and we will intervene much faster. And I think that is uh, going to help tremendously. Yeah, I think that may have been the main point of the question is yes. whether those new technologies could, in fact, help us to monitor yep. these patients. And I think the answer is yes, but we're still way behind in doing that, let's say even outside of clinical trials. Yes, go ahead, Eduardo. Yeah, Eduardo Zabonere. Um, Jose mentioned that we're not lacking ideas, but we're lacking his funding. For, I can't see Jose. Uh, it, we're lacking his funding for the ideas. And um, my understanding that the National Cancer Institute gets approximately $6 billion a year. NCI gets $33, $35 billion. And in defense for 2018, it's going to be like $825 billion in that order. And um, uh, where are we failing? I mean, people are dying from diseases much more than from wars and other things. And uh, are we failing in the political arena? Why is it that the defense industry has so much more clout than our scientific community? And what can we do about it? Because that really is a huge uh, opportunity if we could really get funding. So the argument goes, and maybe that's a question for Beverly, but uh, the argument goes that we spend every year in the U.S. $1 trillion for healthcare, and we are investing in research far less than any industry would, you know, because in the classical industry, you would have uh, a much higher percentage. So we are failing. I don't know where we're failing. I think we're failing that we are not communicating well. We do not communicate, and I think that's upon us. Uh, I think that's key. And somehow, uh, I don't know, but it's a massive failure. Uh, I don't know the causes exactly. Communication is one, but it's certainly not the only one. We, we aren't very good at advocacy. And I think that, I mean, if you look at breast cancer women, they were very good advocates, and they've done much better, not well enough, but they've done better than other diseases. But most of people, uh, even patients, don't advocate enough with their senators, with the government. And we really have to learn how to do that, how to be better advocates as scientists, as physicians, and as patients. The scary thing is that I think many of the legislators are behind this, but the amount of the budget that's actually available for uh, so-called discretionary spending, it's basically defense, education, and health. And a lot of the rest of the budget is, is predetermined. So we have to really argue <laughs> for that piece that we can get from, from defense, if possible. Um, but it's amazing how many congressmen, if you go to Capitol Hill, they, they all are in favor of, of health and medical yeah. research. And, and when something happens, like the Biden initiative, was because his son died of cancer. So that's depressing, obviously. Yeah. When it touches them, that there is sensitivity. When it doesn't... So, so Joseph, 
end on a positive note. <laughs> <laughs> okay, more money. <laughs> more money, more... But, more but uh, uh, also I would say, I think that more money in translational research. Yes. That's right. my impression. So I think that the way NIH, and with the root map, but with the, the, the old root map in 2004, was already a, a first step switching to more translational research, but still, if you check the calls and everything, still a lot of funding for pure basic research without the translational component. So I think that it's key to prioritize translational research. Yeah, I think it's really the theme of this entire conference, which is how you use innovation, technology, uh, translation to better people's lives. So with that, I'm gonna stop, thank the panelists for a great discussion, and thank you.